Hello, it's Saturday the 22nd of August. You're tuned in to our 6pm newscast coming to you from Maddie Dang's News Centre in Seoul. It's very good to have you with us. I'm Mark Broom. Our top story this evening, in a striking turn of events, high-level officials from the two Koreas have just started a hastily arranged meeting at the Truce Village in the demilitarized zone. Now, tensions have spiked to levels not seen in a few years after the two sides exchanged artillery fire earlier this week. For details, we have our presidential office correspondent, Choi Yusun, on the line. So, Yusun, as we understand it, officials from Seoul and Pyongyang started talks just a few moments ago. How did the two sides come to this agreement? Hi, Mark. Uh, South Korea's top security advisor, Kim Guan Jin, and Unification uh, Minister Hong Yong Pyo were scheduled to have started their, uh, are known to have started their high level meeting with the North Korean military's political department director, Hwang Byung Sa, and the ruling Workers' Party secretary, Kim Yang Gun, at 6 p.m. at the Truth Village of Panmunjom. In a surprise announcement at 3 p.m., the head of the South's National Security Council Secretariat, Kim Yu Hyun, said the two sides agreed to the latest meeting after North Korea proposed it Friday afternoon. While Pyongyang first suggested a one on one meeting between the South's top security advisor, Kim Guan Jin, and its ruling party secretary, Kim Yang Gon, Seoul requested the North's top military official, Hwang Byung Sa, to come to the meeting. Pyongyang then suggested a two-plus-two meeting that would also include the South Korean unification minister, which uh, Seoul accepted. Hwang byung is known to be North Korean leader Kim Jong-un's top military aide and led a delegation to South Korea last October for the closing ceremony of the Asian Games. He and Kim Guan jin had met at the time, and some experts say agreeing to send Hwang to the meeting today reflects North Korea's will to renew dialogue with the South. Mark? And you, son, given the situation at the moment, it's highly likely the officials will mainly focus on the ongoing tension here on the Korean Peninsula. What can we expect out of this meeting? Well, Mark, we can expect South Korea to demand the North to apologize for its recent landmine blast in the demilitarized zone that left two South Korean soldiers seriously injured. Uh, so we will also likely seek Pyongyang's apology for the latest artillery fire that triggered the escalating of tensions this week, as, as well as promise of preventive measures. North Korea, which denies responsibility for both incidents, is expected to demand the South to stop its anti-Pyongyang broadcast that resumed after the recent landmine attack. And considering the fact that the South's unification minister is in attendance today, the two sides may exchange views on non-military issues, such as resuming reunions of families separated by the Korean War. But with Pyongyang strongly denying responsibility for the recent attacks, it's difficult to predict whether the two sides will bring about a substantial outcome from today's meeting. It, however, is worth acknowledging that the two Koreas managed to agree to talks just hours before North Korea's deadline to take further military action today uh, should the South continue its propaganda broadcast. It's also the first time that uh, Seoul and Pyongyang are holding ministerial-level talks in nearly eight years. Well, that's all I have for now. This was Chae Sun reporting on the two Korea's high-level talks that are underway. And I'll be back with more details at 10 p.m. Seoul time. So, high-level talks are underway, but the military standoff continues at the inter-Korean border. A deadline set by North Korea passed one hour ago with no provocations or attacks as of yet, at least. Pyongyang had threatened to attack loudspeakers on the South Korean side that broadcast anti-regime propaganda. For more details, we connect to Kim Hyun-bin at the Ministry of National Defense in Seoul. Hyun-bin, what's the latest? Uh, well, Mark, as you, can, uh, as you can imagine, tensions on the border remains high. And as you mentioned, we are now one hour after the 48-hour deadline imposed by Pyongyang. Now, North Korea said it wanted the shot to shut off the, its propaganda speakers by that time, uh, something Seoul hasn't done. Now, Defense Ministry officials told reporters here that they are waiting to see the results of those high-level talks at Panmunjom. As the South Korean representative could agree to halt the propaganda broadcast to cool tensions. In the short time since the deadline passed, there have been so no signs of provocations, but the South Korean military is on its highest state of alert to deal with any contingencies. North Korea said it has completed preparations for military action, and troops on the front line are said to be awaiting orders. The regime deployed some heavy-duty artillery inside the demilitarized zone on Saturday in what appears to be a sign it is serious, serious about possibly striking out against the loudspeakers. 
Now, most experts uh, say an all-out conflict is unlikely, but a North Korean provocation of some sort is certainly not out of the question in the coming hours. The South Korean military says its artillery, F-15s, and Aegis destroyers are ready to strike any targets in the North if provoked. Now, the United States has also reiterated on a number of occasions that it's steadfast in its defense of the South. Now, we still don't know what will happen or not. But as a precautionary measure, over 15,000 residents who live on South Korea's five West Sea border islands and near the DMZ have been evacuated to safer areas. Well, this has been Kim Hyun-bin reporting live from the Ministry of National Defense in Seoul. Now, South Korea's rival political parties have welcomed the high-level inter-Korean talks that have just started in Panmunjom. Chairman of the ruling Senate Party, Kim Musang, said he expects the talks to help defuse tensions. Moon Jae-in, leader of the main opposition New Politics Alliance for Democracy, echoed Kim, saying he hoped the talks would produce a good result. The top party officials also said the political circle will halt all political bickering over domestic issues for the time being. They have promised to ensure national security and the people's safety and added that the government should manage the current security situation carefully and peacefully. Now, the militaries of South and North Korea remain on their highest state of alert despite the high level talks at Panmunjom and the passing of the North deadline with no uh, provocations or attacks as of yet. But for more on what has been a tension filled day so far, Shin Se Min reports. The two Koreas were busy making moves on Saturday in the lead up to North Korea's 48 hour deadline that passed as of 5 p.m. South Korea time. South Korea and the United States flew eight fighter jets over the skies of South Korea in a show of force towards the north. The South Korean military says four U.S. F-16s and four South Korean F-15K fighter jets worked together for the one-hour-long combat drill and a clear demonstration of the two allies' combined air force power. An official said the drill, which simulated bombings of enemy targets, showed the Allies' determination that any kind of provocation will not be tolerated. Earlier Saturday, South Korea's chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, Che Yun hee and his U.S. counterpart, General Martin Dempsey, agreed over the phone that they would strongly respond to any attacks from the North. Dempsey said the U.S. military was, quote-unquote, ready to provide any support in case of an emergency situation on the Korean peninsula. The North Korean military was seen preparing on Saturday to strike South Korean loudspeakers broadcasting anti-Pyongyang messages. South Korean military sources say North Korea deployed a towed artillery to the DMZ for an apparent attack on the loudspeakers. Other artillery movements were spotted along the border as well. Tensions hit boiling point on Thursday when South Korea fired artillery rounds into North Korea after rockets were fired from the northern side in an apparent attempt to attack the loudspeakers. Shin Se-min, Arirang News. Now, in other news, there was an alarming end to the week on Wall Street, with the Dow Jones Industrial Average tumbling 531 points on Friday. For the week, the Dow is down more than 1,000 points, or 5.8%, its biggest weekly loss in four years. The Dow finished the week at 16,460. Investors have been spooked by fears of a global economic slowdown, particularly centered around China and the U.S. Federal Reserve's expected rate hike. The losses weren't only limited to the Dow either. The S&P 500 fell about 64 points, or 3.2 percent, on Friday. The tech-heavy Nasdaq tumbled around 170 points, or 3.5 percent. Oil prices also fell below $40 a barrel for the first time since 2009. Now, more troubling job figures have been released that show the number of people in Korea classified as long-term unemployed hit an almost 10-year high last month. Statistics Korea says that the number rose 52% on year in July, reaching 121,000, a high not seen since October 2005. It's also the highest July figure since the year 2000, when Korea was still recovering from the 1997 Asian financial crisis. Now, the long-term unemployed are 
defined as job seekers who have not found work for six months or more. They currently make up 12% of unemployed people in Korea. The agency also says the number of working age people who have given up even looking for a job increased more than 7% in July to almost 490,000. There are rising concerns both figures could rise even further as economic conditions remain fairly grim. Samsung Electronics is pulling out all the stops to entice Apple customers away from their iPhones. The Korean firm says it's giving iPhone users the chance to test drive one of its new smartphones, the Galaxy S6 Edge, Galaxy S6 Edge Plus or Galaxy Note 5 for 30 days for just one US dollar. Samsung is billing the promotion as the, quote, ultimate test drive. Those wanting to take Samsung up on their offer will have to sign up for the promotion via Samsung's website through an iPhone. If the customer likes the Samsung phone, they can buy it. If not, they can simply return it in a prepaid package. The move comes as Samsung looks to shore up its position as the largest smartphone maker in the world and wrestle users away from Apple's new larger screen iPhones. Now, before we go, taking a brief look at the weather. And it's going to be a relatively cooler night than we've seen the past few weeks, with the overnight low dipping to a comfortable 19 degrees Celsius in Seoul. Sunday will be pleasant and sunny across most of the nation, with afternoon highs ranging from the mid-20s to low 30s. And we'll see similar conditions on Monday as well. With that, let's take a look at the weather around the world. Well, that's all we have for now. Do enjoy the rest of your Saturday wherever you're watching us and do stay tuned to Arirang TV. We'll be back with our next newscast at 10 p.m. Korea time. Until then, goodbye.